Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Jason Lennox, creator of Lords of the Cosmos. You can check me out on my website, jasonlennox.com. That's L-E-N-O-X. Or you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Lennox artist or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Jason Lennox illustrator. And remember, you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. He has such an amazing style and an amazing story series that I just happened upon. He has a fifth issue on a current Kickstarter right now. We're joined by the ever-talented Jason Lennox. How are you doing today? Kurt, hey, buddy, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, it's good having you on there. And I forgot to mention, he is, of course, the creator of Lords of the Cosmos, because, <laughs> you know, titles are important. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm Jason Lennox, and I've been creating my own comic books since as far back as 2012, so it's been a little over a decade now. I have crowdfunded 10 comic books now and two coloring books and three art books, the, the most most recent one going on now is Lords of the Cosmos 5. To restate the obvious is the fifth issue in my ongoing black and white 1980s inspired science fiction and fantasy uh, anthology series set in a universe where there's technology and magic and super powered villains and then the lawmen that are always trying to keep them from destroying the world, right? Oh, totally. Like when I first opened the, uh, like I got to read issues one through four, which thank you so much for that. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. The line work, the shadows, the black and white art style is an amazing style to see because that's the true epitome of being an artist because you can color over things and that's wonderful. But your line work and your style is just beautiful. Like I was blown away just by the first couple of pages. Thank you. I have always liked working in black and white. Some of the things I've hand inked, I do have some great inkers that I work with, but I always try to set up clean pencils, whether I'm making it or uh, one of the inkers that I'm blessed to work with is doing the work for me. I've always enjoyed 2000 AD, which has historically been an amazing black and white anthology book. So to me, you know, I think when it's done well, I think black and white looks amazing. I love that look. And I'm proud to have, you know, Wars of the Cosmos fit that style of very stark black and white uh, artwork. You know, let's dive into the world of, of course, Lords of the Cosmos here. What was the first inspirational thought that came into your mind that made you want to create this world and these characters? So I was doing a comic book signing at a store in York, Pennsylvania that has since gone out of business. And I remember when I was there at the time, and this was around 20. 15, I think. DC had put out a Masters of the Universe book, and I, and I got a copy because I'm a huge fan of Masters of the Universe. And I remember I took it home and I read it, and I was incredibly underwhelmed with the book. And I remember thinking that that uh, universe and characters just deserve better. And I just was kind of blown away by what I felt was just a very pedestrian book. And I remember thinking it'd be neat to do my own version of Masters of the Universe and not, uh, you know, just doing fan art, but to say, let's take the style and the premise and turn it on its head. And uh, I reached out to one friend, Jason Palmatier, who in turn reached out to another uh, friend of his who's a writer in uh, Hollywood, uh, Dennis Fallon. And we put our heads together and started building uh, our own science fiction fantasy uh, futuristic barbarians uh, universe and we just decided to call it lords of the cosmos as kind of a tip and a nod to masters of the universe so people would kind of get the in-universe theming but know that it's not the same so that's really kind of where it came from or you know as some fans we all are we you know get upset with what we see and then it's like well you know do your own so yeah. lords of the cosmos basically grew out of i'd like to take that genre and i'd like to do 
what I feel is my own take on it and try to do a better job. Whether we've succeeded or not is really up to the readers, but I'm, I'm really happy with what we've done. And I think it's in that theme, it's in that uh, genre, but I believe it's definitely stepped out on its own and, and is very original uh, despite, you know, being familiar. But that's the best thing. Like art breeds creativity and, you know, your vision that you put together with this is definitely showcased in these amazing issues as well, too. The fact that you've had successful crowdfunding campaigns as well uh, is a testament to what you're bringing creatively to the masses. So obviously there's an, an audience and an interest in it as well. You have a fan in myself. That's for darn sure. I love it. It's great. Thank you, Kurt. Thank what you. What's the most misunderstood aspect then about the sci-fi fantasy genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? I think there's a stereotype that it's very childish, hmm. um, and it can be. I think that you can take it in any way you want, and I always kind of look at Batman as a very interesting take on that because there's Batman products and stories for children for like age five, and then there's things like Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, which are very mature, where we can have Batman in all levels of the spectrum. And I think that, you know, the filmation Masters of the Universe was definitely for kids. You know, I remember watching it when I was maybe eight or nine. I mean, it, you know, it was very cool for a very young audience, and, you know, you, you can take that genre and kind of amp it up a little bit. You know, I thought Thundar, which was another thing I enjoyed as a slightly older kid, was a little bit more mature than Masters of the Universe. And I think with Lords of the Cosmos, we've tried to amp it up to maybe an R rating, where it's a little bit more violent and a little bit more serious. So I think that's probably the biggest misunderstanding about that genre is that it has to be for, you know, for very small kids. Uh, Lords of the Cosmos is not for a six to seven year old audience. I would say it's probably 13 and up. Uh, maybe PG-13, like an R-rated movie you might sneak into. So I think that's probably the biggest misunderstood part of that, that it has to be for very small kids. And I don't think it has to be. I think you can take the genre and you can play it seriously. Or, you know, you could play it, you know, more juvenile. But I like to play a little bit, a little bit more for slightly older crowd. That's what I noticed about this as well, too. Your character interactions and the action sequences you have as well, too. Like, you're not afraid to kill off characters. And even in your one shots that I saw later on in, in most of the issues there as well, too. Like, you're building a world from many different avenues and many different perspectives that I don't think many creators actually have a one time to take the time to do and two have really planned it out to that extent. We've always had a very strong vision of the start and the end of Lords of the Cosmos, which we're slowly creeping to. And we have a couple, I would say, key beats that we have to keep the same. But one of the things starting with the first issue was we wanted to involve other writers and other artists and let them explore a little bit with our sandbox. So we've been very lucky to have some talented people work with us to help us expand off of our main story. And each issue uh, is continually building that world, the tree keeps growing with more branches. We're running around exploring and discovering parts of that world, making sure that they do fit in with what has come before, but allowing creators that we've worked with to create, really try to take it to the next level. I'm a big believer that a diversity of ideas and a diversity of thought strengthens a property. So it's always exciting for us to get people and writers and artists to give us different visual styles, different perspectives as we build the world of Lords of the Cosmos. You know, with issue five, you know, we're going to keep getting bigger and more focused in on what we've got and then expanding parts of the world that we haven't really seen that much of. So the idea is that each issue keeps building that world out and there's still areas that we don't know anything about and that's fun too. But it has really been fun to kind of build this self-sustaining uh, original world that we're just exploring together with the readers and you know our fellow creators and some of them have returned and then there's new creators that we're, we're lucky to work with so it's exciting stuff who are some of the people that are have come on more recently or who are some of the creative people that you've had that maybe you didn't expect to be on the series for the fifth issue we have an artist from italy named luigi biancarelli he had stepped in to do the origin story for zemba for a lot of reasons, Zemba kind of becomes the main focus character in this issue as one of the villains because all roads seem to cross over her paths in this issue. And Luigi is an incredibly talented artist that is building her world to a real place. I co-wrote that story with my friend Brendan Hikes from Pittsburgh, and we're exploring what is the day in the life 
of one of the evil priestesses that runs the villain's religious political network and then how that builds into her actions in the main story because she has a big twist in the main story where she decides to get involved with the fallout from issue four where one of the villains has failed and is now being tortured to death by another one of the villains under the orders of the main villain, Umex. He's incredibly talented. Another artist from Italy, Sasha Chiardo, we've had him back. He did the Mordanix origin story in issue four, and he uh, came back to do a story with that I co-wrote with D.W. Khan called Pulse, which is a three-part action-adventure sub-story that kind of goes into some of the wars of the past with the Lords of the Cosmos uh, on planet Aiden. Really excited to have Sasha and Luigi on this issue. Sha Sasha returning and, and Luigi just a new super talent that we were lucky to work with on this uh, coming issue and I hope we have him back for some future stuff. Nice. That's awesome. I love that. Finding a great artist or a great uh, co-writer or uh, a creative talent that maybe you haven't seen is just a breath of fresh air sometimes into a series. I love it. And one of the things that we did, David Newbold, who's an artist that we, we love a lot, and he's done some short stories for us. You know, one of the things he asked us to do was to build a character model sheet for scale, modeling, colors, etc. Colors mostly for the covers because the interior is black and white. You know, as long as, you know, the artists and writers stay on model for those, you know, key characters, like that gives them the freedom to just roll with it as long as it's identifiable with their logos and you know costumes for again the main villains and the main heroes we can really expand off that so it was an important part of the process that we did around issue three to build that character model sheet that we could give to anyone to say this is where we're you know this is what we're building off of looking at your kickstarter campaign which is currently ongoing you have a variety of great tiers here available those that you can catch up on past issues etc but what are some of the tiers that you were looking at expanding upon for maybe past campaigns with this current campaign i think we're definitely able to have more original art on this campaign and, and part of that is we have more hand done art for this uh issue than some of the past ones which we had some digital entries so there is uh, you know much more affordable original art for lords of the cosmos 5 which to me there's some really good pieces you can get at very i feel fair prices as always i try to do a limited amount of sketch covers for each issue and those have been a lot of fun, especially when they say it's Jason's choice and I get to get, kind of go a little crazy for the fans that don't have their own thought for what they want. That's pretty exciting, too. So as always, I think those are really the funnest things to get on any of the campaigns that I do is to snag some of the original art or, or, or get, a, get a Jason sketch cover, you know, grab them while they're still there. Looking at yourself as a creative person here, what was the first time where you learned that language had power? Hmm. I'll be honest, the first time I learned when language had power, I think, was about 20-some years ago, my very first job out of college. And I remember the fellow that I worked as his subordinate was incredibly rude with the things he would say. And nothing that he asked for was necessarily wrong or inappropriate. It was just how he asked for things. And that was in 1998 and 1997. It always stuck with me from being very angry and frustrated at that individual that the way you ask for things and the tone of your voice and the punctuation that goes with that, whether it's you know, written or spoken, can affect how people feel. And that has nothing to do with comic books or creating, but it just has to do with thinking about where I was the audience and I felt it was very rude and it was very condescending. So I think over the years, it's very important to choose your words and to choose how you present your words to present a message. And whether that's in storytelling or whether that's in your day-to-day -day interactions with your fans or your friends, it is very important. And the choice of words is huge. Now, obviously, when we're writing for characters, we may want to make them seem rude or bad or evil or good or caring. So yeah, it is, like I said, I think back to that 97, 98. Yeah. What was the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Hmm. That's a great question. One of the things that sticks with me for creative advice is listen and watch people that you feel are doing better than you. Because if you try to watch and emulate and use them as a guidepost, that's how you get better. And sometimes it's humbling to watch and observe people that you can look at and say, this person's better, but you're not going to get better by just having yourself patted on the back. So it's important to surround yourself with people that make you want to be better. 
sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's hard to find those people. Sometimes, you know, it can be hard to look at things that are better because I think, you know, we all have a little bit of ego and sometimes it's humbling to look at things that are objectively better than what you're doing, whether it's writing or art. But I do think it's very important to take that time to find those people and surround yourself with a, a peer group that pushes you to do a better job. Who is that for you in your life? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you three names of other independent creators that I look at that are doing things like I'm doing. Mike Shea, who does Miskatonic. Hi, I'm always in awe of the work Mike is doing. He's kind of like a mini publishing machine. Another mutual friend that I have with Mike is D.W. Khan, who does Lovecraft PI. D.W. Dave is always working to build his brand. He's always working to build his titles and he is a worker. I'm always amazed by the work he's putting out. And a third creator is Charlie McElvey, uh, who does his book, Spider Squirrel, and it's seemingly about a dozen other projects that he's always working on. And all, all three of those individuals are always pushing their boundaries to do better, do more, and to build what they're doing. I, all three of those individuals are incredibly passionate about making their books. And I look at all three of them as guys that are doing a great job and they're really working hard and I try to listen to all three of them and sometimes that's asking them questions and other times it's just listening and watching what they're doing but all three of those guys put out great products and they're really great people and they're the kind of people that I tried to look at to do better because I think they're doing a great job yeah it's great to have like-minded individuals who are pushing boundaries like you said there it's uh yeah. sure we can always improve in some way shape or form in life and in our creative process we just have to listen yeah yeah no and and, and you know and and sometimes you know it's just watching guys like that you'll notice a little a little tip a little trick something they're doing a little bit better i actually got to meet i'll give you one other person and he may have been on your show at some point i was lucky enough to meet a gentleman named pat shand uh, at Happy Valley Comic Con yeah. and State College. I've really been a big fan of reading Pat's thoughts on crowdfunding. And I was lucky enough to meet Pat. Literally, the guy did not disappoint. I talked to him for about 10 minutes. And he was kind enough to be very generous with his time and thoughts and gave me, you know, without a doubt, he gave me some more amazing uh, advice one-on-one -on -one that were things that I was not aware of. I made it a note as soon as I got to a pen and paper to write down his little nuggets of knowledge because a guy like Pat, and again, I'm sure you know who Pat is. Yeah. Pat's just like a fountain of knowledge. And if you just shut up and listen to a guy like Pat, you'll do better because that guy is one of the smartest people, I think, in the independent comic crowdfunding uh, world. So if you're listening to this and you don't know who Pat Shand is, you know, definitely follow him on some kind of social media. Just listen, uh, because Pat's got a tremendous amount of knowledge. So he would be a fourth person that I kind of look at as someone to say, do better and try to be more like Pat. Yeah, no, I definitely know Pat. He hasn't been on the show, but I'm working towards trying to get him on. Uh, I've ch chatted with him in various spaces as well, too. And he's just an amazing person for sure. Yeah, he, he's, he's an A+. Plus. What was the first thing that you created that made you realize, yes, I could do this professionally? I remember in 2011, I was on the old Heavy Metal Magazine mm -hmm. bulletin board that they used to have on their website, and they were in the process of closing it down just to go full social media. And there was a handful of us that were chatting about doing a short story to submit to them. I ended up connecting with a gentleman that was a writer and letterer. And we made a full color five page short story and submitted it to, to them and actually creating a small story with a beginning, middle and end. And we submitted it to them. It was kind of a weird process because they just kind of were like, thanks. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 you know, whatever. It's it kind of you got the thanks. Uh, we, we may do something with it at some point in the far future. I remember I really enjoyed the process and I was like, well, I know I can make something. I made another short with that writer that was a 13 page short. Right around 2012, we realized that probably they weren't going to be in heavy metal, which was cool. We put those books together and did my first crowdfunding to get a couple bucks to wrap it up for the uh, Griselda Kickstarter and then put them out as a little compilation book with two stories. And I started doing comic book shows in 2012 by just going with having a book. And I remember going to the Scranton Comic Con in 2012 in Scranton, Pennsylvania with, with a stack of books and I sold like 20 books. Nice. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. It's all kind of built off that in the last 11 years. So it was the process of being able to start from scratch, 
put a small team together of three of us because we hired a colorist and then we had myself and Mr. Paul who had written it and uh, we put that uh, story together. It was called Vermin. It was a little five page story. So that was just, you know, creating, you know, an original story and making it from scratch and then building more material to make a book and crowdfunding it and printing it. And that was 11 years ago. And the rest, is, as they say, is history. <laughs> the rest is history. And it's all just been slowly growing that brand and slowly building more material, just putting one foot in front of the other and a constant push to make more and better material and growing an audience that appreciates it and wants to be there for it. Looking at, of course, Lords of the Cosmos, because we've been talking introspectively and that's the style of the show as it is. And I appreciate your answers. But when I first looked at Lords of the Cosmos, I honestly didn't know what to expect because I, I saw the cover image. I saw your beautiful interior work, but I'd never really heard about Lords of the Cosmos. So what is the elevator pitch for it? For those that maybe come to your table at conventions? Kurt, if I had to give an elevator pitch on Lords of the Cosmos, it would go like this. Imagine a black and white anthology like 2000 AD, but the content in it is Masters of the Universe, Thundar the Barbarian, and Flash Gordon. However, the editorial team is like Warhammer, 40K, and Games Workshop. So when you get an issue of Lords of the Cosmos, you're going to have the main story that I do the artwork for, and then some really crazy side stories that go off into some of the areas uh, that we don't have time to explore in the main story to build out the world of Lords of the Cosmos. And if any of those things tickle your funny bone, that you like great black and white anthologies, that you like 80s Masters of the Universe style characters, and you like that kind of editorial bent of a dark world, crazy future with magic and technology, then that's what Lords of the Cosmos is. Now, again, there's all kinds of things inside the book, but to an outsider, that is how I would describe it in broad, well-known terms. But you're hitting on key aspects that those that like us who grew up in the 80s love and, and are passionate about. But you look at it, it's been almost 40, 50 years since the 80s, which is hard, I know, to, right? hard to believe. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not that old. I, I'm still young, right? Like, uh, Yeah, it's, um, getting, it's getting pretty long in the tooth, unfortunately, for us. But what it was it about the 80s and 90s and 2000s that maybe this newer generation have missed? Because you're looking at nostalgia that mm -hmm. we're familiar with, but maybe they're just reaching upon it because they saw it on YouTube or something. Well, I think there's an element of nostalgia that makes people of a certain age, spoiler, you and me, Yeah. Um, you might have some feels that you'll recognize, some familiar beats. And we have some fun doing some callbacks to things that you would say, oh my goodness, those guys did something as a little bit of a tribute. We have toy ads in the back of every issue for a Lords of the Cosmos action figure. Uh, in issue four, we did a Saturday morning cartoon advertisement for the Lords of the Cosmos Saturday morning cartoon and some additional cartoons that you might look sort of familiar, some tongue-in-cheek callbacks. But I think really, if you had no nostalgia and you were much younger and didn't live through the 80s, I personally believe that that style of storytelling doesn't get old. If it's done well, it's still greatly entertaining, whether it's you're having some fun callbacks or that you've never seen it before, that it's just a really cool, fun way to tell stories. And I think that whether you like Lords of the Cosmos or other properties like that, because of some nostalgic callbacks and feels, that's great. But I think that in our case, we do a great job that if you have no nostalgia for it, that we're still standing on our own and we would be entertaining on our own. So I think the nostalgia is kind of a bonus, but we're not standing on that as the only reason that you're buying the book. But I do think that style of storytelling never gets old and is still as relevant today if done well as it was, you know, 40 some years ago. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Hmm. I think... Probably the most inspirational person I've met on this journey, and I'll throw out another name of someone that I really look up to a lot, is a gentleman named Chris Campana, who I just saw is now going to be doing some work on Ghost Rider for Marvel. And I met him at an appearance that I did, I think in 2012, at the comic store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he had been putting out his book for a couple years at that point. Chris always encouraged me to keep doing work and to keep making comic books. I'm always amazed with the work he continues to put out to this day. And I found you know, Chris to be an incredibly inspirational and talented guy to uh, emulate and to be more like Chris. Much love to my friend, Chris Campana. Amazing. Great guy and on my journey. He's been incredibly inspirational to tell me, like I think at my second live appearance to keep going, keep doing it. So yeah, very inspirational. 
From a professional standpoint, you've been putting together this series for a while. You've had multiple Kickstarter campaigns that have been successful, and you continue to be creatively successful in many regards that way. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I do consider myself personally successful. I think there's two metrics you can look at that. One has what I've done been profitable from a bottom line standpoint. That's the business person to me talking. Yes, it has. It's it's made more money than it costs to do, right? So that's kind of a very black and white answer to that question. However, someone could say, yeah, but you could go sell gravel and make money. Would that be the same thing? So the second answer to that is, has it been personally fulfilling to me as an artist? And has it made me feel good? Yes, I really enjoy making art. And if the first one wasn't true and I was just doing it to do it in a vacuum, I would still be enjoying it. So personally, it's been artistically fulfilling to me to do it on top of making a dollar. So by those two metrics, yeah, I've been successful and I really am happy with that. And I would say the third metric to that is there are people that continue to support it with their dollars on you know Kickstarter crowdfunding buying things from my store or from me in person and that they genuinely seem to enjoy it and are excited for more. And over, you know, the last couple of months having people say, Jason, Jason, when's Lords five coming out? That's incredibly fulfilling to have people want to know what's next. And that's, that's awesome. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I think the biggest and easiest way to deal with failure is to take a hard look at it, determine what you did wrong, and then make it a point not to repeat it. And that could be doing something incorrect with your artwork. And I always remember on my second short uh, comic strip, Griselda, I did some teeth wildly inaccurate and a <laughs> reviewer made fun of my horrible teeth. And I remember thinking I will never do that wrong again. And I always make sure that my teeth are correct if I draw people's teeth. So there's things like that. And if something is called out, if it's actionable, make it a point to learn from it and move on and uh, don't do it again get better from those mistakes and don't dwell on them too long. The younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator, uh, an artist, or something along that line that maybe you've inspired them creatively. And the fact that you have the younger generation with your family as well, too, looking up to you as an inspirational person, maybe you're inspiring them as well in some way, shape, or form. Well, I, I don't know. My, we, we, we got, we got, we got, yeah, see, it's, I'm inspiring you guys, right? How about it? <laughs> How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think the biggest way you can get people to be inspired is to do your best at all times and be an example of positivity and positive improvement. And if you're always trying your best, Regardless of the results, people will see that honest effort and they're going to try their best. And really, you know, if I have people that'll say, well, how can I do better? What should I do to be better? It's just get better than what you were doing yesterday and try to constantly improve. That's the only thing you can really control and focus on being a better version of you. If you're doing that, other people will see that and then they'll do their best to try the best possible effort they can put out there. If your life was a comic book or a movie or a series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Hmm. Well, I don't know. My, I, I always kind of go for very, you know, plain, easy to understand titles. So I think I would call it the Jason Lennox story, right? And I think the soundtrack would probably be, well, it would probably just be Slayer, right? Because that's <laughs> mostly what I like to listen to. So yeah, the Jason Lennox story with the soundtrack by Slayer. Well, Jason, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kurt. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign and when does it end? The Kickstarter campaign is going to be, as always, pinned to the top of my social media and my website. So you can go to jasonlennox.com. It'll be pinned at the top. You can go to my social media, which would be on Instagram and Twitter at Lennox Artist or on Facebook as facebook.com slash Jason Lennox Illustrator. And uh, take a look at the top. I'll make it easy for you to find. And as to when it's going to end, I don't have it right in front of me, but just go click on the link and it'll tell you how many days and hours and minutes are left. So 
uh, you know, get to it while you can and back the project. Well, that ends this particular episode of T-Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our website is going through a revamp. So look for it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 13 or so years because reasons and you can find that at two geeks talking or search for two geeks talking on any of your audio streaming services and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking